Why don't you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much that we get to gather together to worship you, to open up your word, to sing songs to you, and, and to partake of uh, communion with you today. We're so grateful for that opportunity. Lord, we do know that there are brothers and sisters around the world who have already woken up today on the Lord's Day and been unable to meet together uh, people in North Korea, Iran, or other places. And Lord, we pray that you would be with them. Give them an extra measure of grace. And Lord, we do pray as, as we navigate this crazy world, there are many heavy hearts in this room for a variety of reasons not the least of which is what's taking place on our national landscape. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would be with our nation. Lord, we desperately need you. Uh, Lord, there are people um, all over the place, all political spectrums, who uh, are, are crying out. And, uh, Lord, we know as the body of Christ, the answer to the world's problems is Jesus. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would allow us to be bastions of hope for this dying world, that they might see the beauty of Christ in us, that we might love our neighbor as ourself and love our neighbor so that they might see Jesus. Lord, I thank you for our, our missionaries serving overseas, and I do want to pray for the Ritter Connects, Lord, in France, that you would be with their ministry, and I know that it's... Uh, it's been hard to do ministry over, the, over these COVID days and with different restrictions. And so, Lord, I do pray that you would give them an extra measure of grace. I also, Lord, uh, want to pray for my friends, the archers, Jonathan and Michelle, as they just arrived in Togo, Africa. And, Lord, I pray that you would allow them and their children um, a peace of mind as they go to a new city. They're in a new culture and a new house, going to new schools, trying to adjust to all of that. And, Lord, during all of all what they're going through. I pray that the gospel would be evident in their lives and Jesus might be lifted up. Lord Jesus, we now pray for our time together today that you would be with us as we preach your word, that you would be with us as we hear your word, that you would be with us as we commune together through song and through the Lord's Supper, that you would be magnified today in us. In Jesus' name I pray and thank you. Amen. So today we have an opportunity that we don't often uh, get, is we are going to hear the word of God read aloud, the whole book, okay, the whole book of Colossians, not the whole book of the Bible. <laughs> We'd be here for weeks, um, eh, maybe a week, but uh, we're going to bring up Pastor Stan, Pastor Stan, if you want to come up here right now, and, and what he's going to do is he's going to start in Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, he's going to go all the way through the end of the fourth chapter. And why we're going to do that is because, one, we're about to start a series through Colossians. And uh, when the Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the church at Colossae, someone would have come up, probably uh, Tychicus, he would have come up and he would have read the whole letter to the church. So we're going to hear the whole letter. It's going to take about 10 minutes. And let's uh, feast on the word, and then we're going to get up and do an overview. All right? Thank you, Pastor Stan. morning. Well, hopefully you don't hear my voice, you hear the Lord's voice as we read the words that uh, were inspired and breathed by God. Colossians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard of the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you, just as in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it, and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, 
who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased praying for you to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have, the red have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God, bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is, the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but now has is but now but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are in Laodicea, and for all of those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all wealth, that comes from full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, so also walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority, 
and in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over, him, over them through him. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink, or in respect to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement, in the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with the growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use, in accordance with the commandments and the teaching of men, these matters, which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked when you lived in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to the true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another, and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, Love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. 
Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Slaves, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. It is the Lord Christ who you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying that this, at the same time for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. As to all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother and faithful servant, and fellow bondservant in the Lord, will bring you information. For I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about our circumstances, and that he may encourage your hearts, and with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they will inform you about the whole situation here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings, and also Barnabas's cousin Mark, about whom you received instruction. If he comes to you, welcome him. And also Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, send you his greetings, and also Demas. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea, and also Nympha, and the church that is in her house. When this letter is read among you, have it also read in the church of Laod the Laodiceans, and you, for your part, read my letter that is coming from Laodicea. Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Grace be with you. It's pretty neat getting to hear the word of God read all in one sitting. And with that, we are going to begin our series in Colossians, which I've entitled Rejoicing in the Supremacy of Christ. Before we get to a lot of Colossians, I want to just step back and want us to think about, we are in the year 2020, the year that will live in infamy, at least until the next world war, global pandemic, or some other catastrophe, right? Just this week, we saw more cities burn in our nation, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We saw a 17-year-old um, shoot men in that city, and those men apparently were attacking him. Oh, in case you haven't heard, 2020 is also an election year. So as we were trying to deal with pandemic or at least a virus that none of us know anything about, everything is politicized. Not to mention all the things that are going on in our own hearts, in our own lives, with our own children, with our spouses, 
inside our own hearts. And yet, on a Sunday, we gather here at the corner of Liberty Mills and Homestead Road to gather together for what purpose? I don't know about you, but I'm tired, sad, heartbroken, angry, fearful, hopeful, but overall, desperate. And I need this place, not, not the building, but you people. You guys need me, and together, we desperately need this word. And so, in the year 2020, we turn our attention to the book of Colossians. And we want to rejoice, in a year that it's not easy to rejoice, in the supremacy of Christ. Christ is king. And in an election year, that still doesn't change, right? So, if you haven't, turn in your Bibles to Colossians. Hopefully, you're already there. And we're going to look at an overview, I mean, this is not the 30,000 foot view, this is going to be the 60,000 foot view of Colossians. We're gonna touch on a few verses, we're gonna get the big idea of the book, and then we're gonna celebrate our Supreme King by taking the Lord's Supper. The big idea in the book of Colossians is that we are called to rejoice in the supremacy of Christ. Rejoice. It's mentioned over and over and over again, and I find it ironic because guess what? Um, here in 2020, again, we don't really want to rejoice. So we turn our attention to a book that's going to call us to rejoice, and not only to rejoice, but it's a book that's going to call us to rejoice in Christ. Because so often we look at our own heart, we look at our own surroundings, we look at our own world, and we get desperate heartbroken, tired, angry, frustrated. And here on a Sunday morning for however long I preach or whoever else preaches, we are going to take satisfaction in our king. We are going to have his word lead us to hope. We might be a little fearful, but that's not why we gather here. That's not why we look to Jesus. We look to Jesus because he is our hope in this hopeless world. So, Colossians, it's, it's a short book, short book, four chapters, 95 verses, took us about 10 minutes to read, right? And thank you, Stan, for reading. Uh, he has our uh, James Earl Jones voice in here, right? <laughs> Sounded a little bit better than if I had done it. In the 95 verses of Colossians, there are 78 references to Christ. So, not quite one-to-one, -one, but very, very close. You would be hard-pressed to find a book in the Bible that talks about Jesus more than the book of Colossians. And so that's why we are looking at the book of Colossians. Now, Gordon, I'm going to try to do this. You ready? Th this is my clicker, and they, every week they're like, hey, use, use the clicker. This clicker is giant, isn't it? So here we go. Let's see. Oh, it works, though. So about Colossians. The, the author of the book of Colossians is the Apostle Paul. He says that in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Um, so Timothy is sitting there going, go Paul, yes, yeah, say that. Uh, and someone else was writing it down. Paul signed it at the end. So it could have been Timothy writing it down, could have been someone else writing it down. But all in all, Paul's the author. Ultimately, the author is God, right? Um, he is in prison. So isn't it ironic that Paul is going to write to the, the church at Colossae and he's going to tell them to rejoice in Christ as he's sitting in a Roman prison somewhere between the dates 60 and 62 AD. And so Paul writes about the, the glories of Christ and rejoicing in him to a church, ironically enough, that Paul probably never even visited. Uh, it's the church at Colossae. Now I'm going to show you something here. Um, in, in case you didn't know where Colossae was, and do I have a, is there actually a laser pointer? Oh, there is. Ooh, look, it's tiny though. Um, this is Colossae. Um, Paul would be up there in Rome. All right. So, so Paul is in prison and he's writing this letter to a church that he probably never visited. And 
here's the reason why. See, Colossae was a big city in the ancient days, but about four or 500 years before Jesus ever walked on the earth. Um, so by the time of the days of Paul, Colossae was kind of like a rust belt city. You see, they, they had uh, this special wool that they called purple, but it was actually crimson. I don't know when we decided to change the color names there, but they, they were known for that. But then two other cities were built, Laodicea and Hierapolis, which were only about 12 miles away from Colossae. So Colossae uh, had everyone move out. Uh, they don't have a lot of jobs. There's about 25,000 people. Um, and so it would look a lot like uh, the city of Marion in Indiana or Muncie in Indiana. I, and I, I, li I like those cities. <laughs> I, 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 I get, what, what? No, I like those because they were good at Indiana high school basketball back in the day. But we know that they've seen better days, right? So that's where Colossae is. And yet, this insignificant church in what is modern-day Turkey has a book in the Bible addressed to them. Interesting enough. Uh, Ephesus is where Paul would have had contact with Colossae. This is how the letter came about. Um, there's this guy called Epaphras. Epaphras is the founder of the church of Colossae. He's actually a native Colossian. So he went to the capital of their area, he went to Ephesus, and he heard the Apostle Paul preaching the gospel. Paul, in Acts chapter 19, was telling all of Asia Minor about the gospel. And so in Acts 19.10, during that two-year period of time, Epaphras heard the gospel, was radically saved, and went back to his hometown and started a church. Wonderful. Now, Epaphras is the pastor of that church. He ends up having to go and find Paul because there's an issue in Colossae. There's these people called the Gnostics, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S, Gnostics. And these Gnostics were saying, you have to have some type of special knowledge and information to actually follow Jesus, which was utterly not the case. And Epaphras wanted to know how he could combat this heresy. So Epaphras travels all the way to Rome. Now think about this. That would take a while in, in even today's age, right? It would take five hours, six hours on a flight. Um, and you'd have to stop over different parts and, you know, traveling passport. But that would have taken months, even possibly up to a year to travel from Colossae all the way to Rome. Well, Paul hears what's going on, and he writes this book, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, to combat the heresy of the Gnostics, but also to encourage the Colossians in the supremacy of Christ and to tell them to rejoice. So he sends a guy called Tychicus. Tychicus then travels. He must have been fast. He travels to Colossae. He has the scroll in hand, and he reads it out to the people, just like Stan read it out to us. And then it was delivered to the church of Colossae. They were supposed to trade with the church at Laodicea so other people could benefit from hearing that Christ is supreme. So the themes of Colossians. Well, the first and greatest theme of Colossians is Christ. Christ is central to this book. He is seen as supreme, and he's also seen as sufficient. Look with me at chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, we're going to read a few verses here. This is called the Christ hymn. We don't know if it actually originated with Paul. It could have been an early church praise song. But it is filled with theology of who Jesus is. So, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. They don't write him like they used to. That is, whoo, a lot of theology there. It's all about Christ. We see the sufficiency of Christ. Look at chapter 1, verse 4. 
Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have had for all the saints, right? That's, that's why they are writing. That's why Paul and Timothy are, okay, we, we hear about you and you love Jesus, that he is sufficient for this message. And then look at 2.4. In 2.4, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, okay? So what, what is Paul saying there? Plausible arguments? Well, look up a couple of verses uh, to verse 1 in chapter 2. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have had for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. So again, Paul has not seen these people, but he's struggling, he's praying for them, he's writing to them. Why? That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Okay, so he wants them to know the gospel, to know Jesus, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so he says this because he doesn't want a delusion to come in. He doesn't want their theology to be watered down by the Gnostics who have some plausible arguments. The Gnostics had some secret documents and they said, oh, you haven't read this? <laughs> I don't know if you really are in Jesus. And so people are struggling. Am I in Christ? Do we still struggle with that today? Absolutely. People struggle with the assurance of salvation and, and Paul's writing that you can have the assurance of knowing the mystery of God who is Jesus Christ. And that you're not going to be deluded by people coming in and having these plausible arguments, but they're not true. Christ was sufficient. Not only that, but the kingdom which believers find rescue from darkness belongs to Christ. In verse 13, okay, there's darkness all around this world. We understand it well right now. And in verse 13, we see he has delivered us, that's Jesus has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So God is working that out. Not only that, but Christ's physical body has reconciled the Colossians to God and will present them holy. So not only is he taking them to God, but he's changing their hearts. It's amazing. Verse 22 of chapter 1 says that he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Oh, I need that. I need that. And also, pause on this. We're going to read a lot of scripture today, and I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not apologizing for that because we're always in this pulpit going to be handcuffed to the word of God. Um, but when you're doing an overview of a book, you don't have time to just like sit there, right? So we're helicoptering in and barely landing and we're, we're popping around. So there's a lot of scripture today, but I cannot wait for the next 12 weeks to be preaching this book and, and for us to feast on, on this word of God that we need so desperately. So anyway, you might be saying, ah, he's popping around a lot today. Yes, it's an overview. So we're popping and we're going to the next spot. Anyway, Christ is also the wisdom and treasures of God hidden in him. All the wisdom and treasures of God are hidden in Christ. Look at verse three. So, so it's Christ in, uh, sorry, verse three of chapter two. I need to give you good references though for bouncing around in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then chapter 3, flip over a page or two, chapter 3, verse 1, Christ, uh, this, this is amazing, Christ will have raised, hidden, and appeared. So he does that for us. He will raise us, he hides us in him, and we appear in Christ. If then you have been raised with Christ, so Christians are raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So we're hidden in him. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There is such hope there. It's amazing. And then look at verse 3. Uh, or in chapter 3, verse 17, everything believers do 
should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is sufficient for our task. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. We're going to go through these next themes a little bit quicker. We're also going to see the theme of the church. The church, the body of Christ. So if you flip back with me to chapter 1, and you look at verse 18, we see that in verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church. So again, Paul uses similar ideology as he does in 1 Corinthians where he says, we're the body of Christ. But who's our head? Who's the most important part of the body of Christ? Jesus himself. Verse 24 of chapter 1 says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Again, reinforce that we are the body of Christ. Do we really think of ourselves like that? Here at a little Aboit Baptist church on the corner of Liberty Mills and Homestead Road, do we think that we're the body of Christ? Well, we are. We're also going to look at the theme, the gospel. The gospel uh, in verse 5 of chapter 1 and verse 8. Um, so because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and growing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So, so we have the themes of the gospel also called numerous times in chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 4, the mystery of Christ. We're also going to look at the theme of the Christian life. Now, uh, New Testament scholar Doug Moo says this, Few texts in the New Testament make the case so clearly that cr Christian living must be rooted in Christ. Now, as I have most Sundays, I have uh, my cowboy boots on. I wear cowboy boots almost every day. So, uh, a lot of us like to think that our Christian life is pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps, right? So, we, got it. we have to do it. Ugh. We have to do it. That's not the case. See, what Colossians is going to do is Colossians is going to show us that we have to look to Christ and his gospel and then be transformed from the inside out and that we will live lives of obedience to Christ because you heard, you heard the Christian living aspect of that, right? Um, wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, don't be harsh with your wives. Children, obey your parents. Um, fathers, don't exasperate your children. Like, Okay, those, those are clear commands from God, but how we're supposed to do that, how we're supposed to live that out is because of the gospel in us. Then we look at Christ and we say, out of worship for you, King Jesus, I'm going to obey. And that changes our attitude because when we're trying to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, and that's how I understood the Christian life for a really long time, that I just had to, I had to do better, that builds up legalism. And legalism is the do's and don'ts, and the do's and don'ts will kill you. But Christ and his gospel will free you to live for him. So we look at the Christian life. Um, we're also going to look at thanksgiving. Again, the title of this uh, series is Rejoicing in the Supremacy of Christ. And, and in, I'll give you two references here. Chapter 1, verse 24, says this. Now, I rejoice, what's Paul rejoicing about? In my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. He's rejoicing in his sufferings. He's writing from prison. This is incredible. And then look at chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, so live for Jesus, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Our Christian lives are to be lived as thanksgiving to God. It's incredible. So, why do we need Colossians? Notice, none of those points changed. 
Why do we need the book of Colossians in our life? Because we need Christ. We need to know the supreme king of the universe. We need to know who he is, what he's done for his body, the church. And he did that through the work of the gospel. Okay? And then the gospel is what allows us to live a Christian life. And that Christian life is to be a life of thanksgiving and worship to God. That's our brief overview of the book of Colossians. And we will be getting into the nitty gritty of it over the next 12 weeks. And I am looking so forward to that. But at this point, what we're going to do is our Lord's Supper. And I want to tell you why we are uh, partaking of this. And then we're going to have the praise team come up. And you guys, we're going to sing a few songs. Then we are going to uh, then partake in the Lord's Supper. And I'll give you instructions because... I don't think any of us have ever done communion quite like what we're going to do today, okay? Because Brandon and I made it up two weeks ago. <laughs> um, these little cups right here, I have not tried uh, the grape juice. We did buy grape juice. If there's a little twang to it, I apologize. Um, but this grape juice represents the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ was poured out for us. This is the gospel, my friends that the blood of Christ was poured out for us so that we should have died on the cross for our sins. Do we lie? Do we cheat? Do we steal? Do we have bad thoughts? Do we gossip? Do, do we live lives of the flesh? Oh yeah, we know that. And Christ died for us. So this juice is not Christ's blood, but it represents Christ's blood. And we do that in remembrance of him. And then on the other side, flip it over. There's a gluten-free uh, little piece of cracker. I have no idea how, how it tastes, okay? But this is going to represent the body of Christ. The body of Christ that was on that cross for us. And we do this in remembrance of him. So what we're going to do is celebrate what Jesus did. To celebrate what Paul wrote to the Colossians about is the supremacy of Christ, that the Son of God came down from heaven, that he lived a perfect life that none of us could ever live. He died on the cross, as Scripture said, for the sins of the world, and that he was in the grave for three days, rose again, and he conquered sin, death, and the devil, and he's offering us hope for anyone who believes in him. If you, have put, if you have placed your trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, we welcome you to partake of this communion. If you still have questions about Jesus, we would ask that you would refrain from this because Scripture does say that if you eat this in an unworthy manner, uh, harm could come to you. <laughs> we don't want that for you. And so we would ask that you would not partake if you don't know Jesus today. But if you want to know Jesus, I would love to talk to you. Anybody in here. Uh, Pastor Brandon would love to talk to you. Pastor Dan, Daniel would love to talk to you. Pastor Stan, uh, I think there's a lot of people in this room that would be willing to talk to you, and I see heads nodding. So, what we're going to do when, after we sing two songs, we're going to get our hearts ready to take the Lord's Supper, and then uh, at the end of the two songs, uh, we'll have some instrumental music playing. And what I want you guys to do is, uh, as we prepare our hearts after the singing, uh, and as you are seated, uh, if you could be praying in your heart, um, and then when you feel led, and I know this is a little bit different because I'm throwing a curveball at the deacons. I said they would somehow dismiss. Um, pay attention. We have uh, four tables, one, two, three, four back there. Um, try to not crowd the tables at all. We even socially distanced our communion <laughs> up here. Um, and if we could have maybe one or two representatives from your family to grab it, uh, grab what you guys need, and then take it back to your seats. And then what we will all do is I'll get back up here after an amount of time, and then we will partake of the cup and the bread together. Okay? Will you stand with us? Sing along and worship the Lord. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises, robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescends. 
redemption. See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery, slain by death.
verse 28 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So what we just did, uh, Lord willing, was examine our hearts. I'm going to say a prayer for all of us right now. Uh, Communion, the Lord's Supper, Lord's Supper is an individual act, but it's also a collective act. We do it together. And so let me say a prayer right now uh, for us. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this day. And Lord, I know that I, my own heart is desperate, desperately wicked and in need of a Savior. And thank you, Jesus, for being that Savior of my heart. And Lord, we forget you. We are not mindful of you. We do not sing your glories day after day. We do not live for you often. People who say we love Jesus and want to live for Jesus, we fail. And so, Lord, I do ask that you would forgive us as a whole. And, Lord, I pray that my friends, my brothers and sisters have asked forgiveness in their heart. And, Lord, as we take the cup and the bread, Lord, we want you to be honored and glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray and thank you. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes just before that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. And also, don't uh, do not do your juice yet. We're going to flip it up. We're going to do the bread first, okay? That could be detrimental. We do have some leftovers. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we glory in the cross. And so while communion is a sober time, we had some time that was semi-quiet, we had some time of reflection and examining our hearts. What we're going to do right now is we're going to sing our heads off and praise Jesus for what he's done on the cross. And so we're going to bring the praise team back up and we're going to sing praises to the Lord who died on the cross for our sins, who rose again, and who is coming back one day.
Father, we thank you for this glorious morning where we have been able to hear your word declared as it was read to us and also as we heard um, this letter as it was preached uh, to us this morning. And even as a, a brief overview, Lord, recognizing, Lord, um, all the truth that is found in it, Lord, and that we want to glorify you. We want to praise you today. Lord, thank you for allowing us to take part in remembrance of your sacrifice by taking part in communion and then singing your praises, Lord, praises that you deserve. Lord, help us to not stay silent. Help us to continue to proclaim the gospel message, Lord Jesus. To ourselves first, yes, that we remind ourselves what it means to be in Christ, but also to proclaim these truths far as they could go, Lord, whether it be here in Fort Wayne, whether it be across as our brothers and sisters proclaim your truth in these persecuted locations. But Lord, help us to take seriously what it means to be a believer and to spread the gospel message, Lord, to make disciples you commanded us to do. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. 